During the last 15 years, American primetime television dramas, like other cultural forms, seem to have rediscovered politics. Especially shows discussed under the label of quality TV have repeatedly been celebrated and or dismissed for the openly political agenda. Be it for an engagement with the anxieties, uh, anxieties connected to the war on terror, for example, as on Homeland or 24, or for attempts to tackle the social ills of contemporary urban America, as on The Wire or, to a lesser degree, on Breaking Bad. Simultaneously, other popular programs that at first glance seem to background political concerns in favor of more escapist content, that is, um, for example, mystery-centric science fiction or fantasy shows like Battlestar Galactica, Fringe, or Heroes, increasingly engage with matters of politics, power, and political intrigue, and develop these motifs in uh, ongoing storylines. Interestingly, this renewed interest in political subject matters has coincided with the emergence of what Jason Mattel has termed narratively complex television. That is, a by now, a by now pervasive shift in emphasis away from episodically contained storylines towards an ongoing serial narration that allows for the unfolding of long-running complex storylines with several, interse several intersecting subplots. At the same time, this emphasis on serial storytelling allows these shows to construct richly furnished, expansive story worlds in which the complexities and intricacy of, of political systems and processes might be more adequate, uh, adequately represented than in more traditional episodic formats. Several recent media and cultural studies publications have similarly connected this trend towards narrative complexity to television's turn to political subject matters and discuss textual strategies of serial um, television texts in close relation to their representation of politics, however defined. Such discussions frequently follow what Frank Kelleter and Daniel Stein, with reference to scholarship on popular seriality in general, have recently termed the X and Y model of seriality study studies, and focus on, contempor on how serial texts like television shows um, reflect and negotiate certain, certain political concerns. For example, by investigating issues like political allegory in Battlestar Galactica, gender representations in Mad Men, as we will hear later, or uh, paranoia in the X-Files. From a different perspective, reception-oriented media studies scholars like Henry Jenkins have located the political significance of popular texts in the practices of media audiences and conceptualized the latter's cultural and textual productivity as examples of a potentially subversive participatory culture. Arguing that popular serial texts would inspire processes of communal problem solving and thus give rise to a collective intelligence that, was, that would express itself in social online media, Jenkins and others have celebrated these developments and put forward the somewhat utopian claim that su such um, participatory practices could be preparing the way for a more meaningful and more democratic public culture. And this is somewhat problematic, I think, but I won't really go into that that much. Um, contemporary studies on the politics of television series therefore seem to frame the subject uh, or the matter of politics either as an issue of thematic concerns or as an issue of audience practices, but both of these perspectives are only rarely combined. Um, today, I want to argue that recent conceptualizations of popular seriality, and um, with this I refer to concepts of popular seriality that have been developed by the same title research unit, um, of which I'm a part. Um, I want to argue that uh, recent, that these conceptualizations of popular seriality um, might allow us to bridge the gap that seems to exist between, between these two perspectives. Such approaches consider seriality not exclusively as a matter of narrational strategy, but instead as an organizing principle that facilitates an ongoing interaction between producers, audiences, media technologies, and serially unfolding texts, an interaction that occurs over longer periods of time, because serials are told in installments over time. Advocating such a view, Ruth Meyer, for example, has char characterized popular serials as machinic constellations in Deleuze and Guattari's sense of the term that frames the machine as a contraption or ensemble that conjoins living beings and technological apparatuses into intricately layered arrangements of interaction. As parts of such constellations, she argues, serialized narrative, uh, narrative texts function as instigators for the interlocking of subjects and apparatuses media institutions, instances, and scenes, and enable and negotiate these interactions between these different actors. These approaches suggest that an emphasis on matters of form, uh, these approaches suggest an emphasis on matters of form rather than on matters of content. And they see the textual form of uh, serial narratives 
and their individual installments as shaped by the concrete social, cultural, and medial conditions under which this interaction takes place. The analysis of the, cultural, uh, of the formal characteristics of popular serial texts, like television sh shows, can thus point us to the social context and medial environments in which these shows operate. At the same time, um, the formally and medially specific features of individual series set the terms for a particular preferred mode of serial engagement. <coughs> that is, they su suggest a way in which audiences are expected to respond and follow a serially unfolding text. Um, proceeding from these rather abstract ideas, um, I now turn to uh, complex television shows and um, I want to argue that following these thoughts on popular seriality that the significance of these shows is not limited to uh, levels of theme and content but manifests itself in the specific textual strategies by which these shows seek to activate their viewers and engage them in specific reception practices. As commercially produced texts that, on the one hand, become, become more profitable the longer they remain on air, and on the other hand, compete with countless other series and media formats that have arisen with the digitalization of our media environment, contemporary television series need to find ways to capture the attention of their audiences on a regular basis. It is only in this situation that television dramas turn to complex and increasingly serial storytelling to foster a long-term relationship to their viewers. By doing so, as Frank Kelleter has put it, contemporary complex shows articulate a medial dictate of concentration and attentiveness, as they are told in a manner that one can hardly follow them adequately without repeated viewings or a heightened attention to long-term developments and detail. Quote, unquote. At the same time, as commercially produced texts, complex series need to, extract, uh, need to attract a sizable chunk of the audience to be profitable. They thus need to f find ways in which to periodically reduce their own narrative complexity in order to remain accessible. Long-running complex shows, therefore, find different ways to manage, structure, and organize the reception practices of their viewers. And um, this endeavor, this attempt to organize the reception of their viewers, calls for specific textual practices that facilitate um, the orientations of viewers within the continually unfolding serial narrative and that alert the viewers to what has happened before, to what might happen next, and to what might happen next. That is, it um, foregrounds the serial character of the texts. Complex shows therefore have the tendency to produce moments, to repeatedly, to repeatedly produce moments in which they become formally and medially self-reflexive. And medially self-reflexive in a way that um, I think someone over there, you was, um, address it in the last talk, not in an alienating way of medial self-reflexivity, but one that actually contributes to the immersion in the serial narrative. Um, I now want to turn to uh, specific, specific medially self-reflexive moments in narratively complex television shows um, that one could consider to be an example of these kinds of audience management. And these, these textual st strategies, I would argue, have a political significance of their own. By seeking to encourage specific reception practice or specific ways of watching a show, these shows attempt to exert control over the attention of their audience and seek to, seek to direct it towards a commercially, uh, commercially viable, viable, viable way of engaging with a serial text. As noted, we can consider narratively complex shows um, to be torn between the capability to develop long-running storylines and the commercially motivated demands to be accessible. They solve this problem softly by conventionalized, conventionalized devices like, the, like previously on segments that recap backstory and other kinds of exposition. Um, partly, um, the accessibility of complex television narratives is also ensured by the, um, by the media environment in which they operate. That is, complex shows would be more difficult to watch without digital video formats, without time-shifting devices, without online video streaming services, or with out what Jason Mattel has termed orientational paratexts like fan sites, wikis, or blogs that chart the narrative developments of complex shows. In addition, um, as I've already mentioned, complex shows repeatedly produce scenes in which they thematize, demonstrate, and comment on the operations of serial storytelling and the logics, and at the same time on the logics of the diegetic events that are narrated. Such moments constitute particular instances of what Neil Harris, in a very different context, 
has called the operational aesthetic. That is a formal strategy that invites audiences to observe processes as well as outlines and components part, component parts of an object and to see what role they play in the operation of a whole. In his discussion of complex television, Jason Mattel has taken up this idea of operational aesthetics or of the operational aesthetic and argued that it would be at work in particularly spectacular moments of storytelling. And we have just mentioned this uh, in the last Q&A session as well. For example, in the plot, plot twists of a show like Lost, in which a play with the conventions of television storytelling would, quote, call attention to the constructed nature of narration and ask viewers to watch the process of narration as a machine, while at the same time not really distracting from that what goes on within the diegesis. <clears throat> I would like to argue today that um, these kinds of operational aesthetics are, however, not limited to such overly, um, obviously formally aware storytelling technique um, strategies, but that they um, instead are manifest in, in a variety of um, textual strategies and formal devices that serve to, to orient the viewer within the narrative. And this would also include the more conventional devices of recapitula recapitulation and exposition that I mentioned a minute ago. <clears throat> In what follows, I would um, thus point to another set of such operational moments, namely, on, namely to scenes in which these shows thematize the medial conditions under which they operate. These are scenes in which a diegetic use of digital media technologies serves to both advance the plot and suggest a particular way of watching the show. I take my examples from uh, Two different, oh, and we have missed this point, but I told you all about it. Um, and I have three examples here on the foil, but I actually, for reasons of time and management, and attention management, I will also only talk about Fringe and Homeland and um, serve perhaps the House of Cards example for the discussion. <clears throat> In all of these shows, medially self-reflexive scenes are intricately bound up with the central storylines of um, these shows. And accordingly, also with uh, each serious particular take on political subject matters. Fringe, for example, a mystery-centric show in the vein of the X-Files, presents a paranoid view of politics in which a fundamentally good social order is threatened by the sinister actions of a vast conspiracy from beyond the limits of the ordinary world, and in which the protagonists serve as a last line of defense against paranormal forces. Narratively fringe, not unlike the X-Files, relies on an open-ended storytelling structure in which the protagonists' um, investigative ef efforts are, constant, are always one step behind the actions of the conspiracy and in which the truth always remains just out of reach. Again, like the X-Files, Fringe seeks to keep its viewers guessing about the narrative enigmas at the center of the show and foregrounds this element of mystery as a central narrative hook. And one of these uh, mysteries that occurs on Fringe um, is a kind of myst mysterious figure of a bald man that appears in the background uh, of, of every episode, I think, in a kind of Alfred Hitchcock-like cameo where he's barely visible. And this figure is called the Observer. And he appears from the first episode on. And, we, uh, and here's a screenshot from Fringepedia where users have catalogued, it's a wiki on Fringe, where users have catalogued the appearances of this figure, although you can't really see it, I think, I'm afraid. Um, Okay, um, bup, bup, bup. so <clears throat> it wasn't until halfway through the second show of the shows of, um, of Fringe that the show's narrative itself acknowledged the omnipresence of this mysterious figure. More than a year after the, after the Observer first appeared, the, um, a second season episode fleshed out his backstory, which is far too complicated to restate here. <laughs> and um, alerted less attentive viewers to its, to, his present, to its presence. Significantly, the scenes in which this happens, in which the presence of the observer is thematized, are medially self-reflexive, and I hope you can see that here. They feature scenes in which uh, the major, main characters engage with um, digital video equipment and try to parse out where, where this figure appears. Um, by doing so, Fringe um, demonstrates a particular use of digital video technologies that parallels the behavior of those dedicated Fringe viewers who have catalogued 
the earlier appearances of this figure online. This episode therefore advocates a particular way of watching the show, of engaging with the series, and, present it, and presents it as a preferred way of watching television, an active mode of spectatorship that entails a heightened attention to detail, the readiness to rewatch individual episodes, and to um, analyze scenes on the level of individual frames, and also to engage in social online media. This model of spectatorship is not unlike the way in which a conspiracy theorist makes sense of the world. It asks viewers to be always on the lookout for suspicious signs of conspiratorial activity and to subject each episode to an attentive and detail-obsessed computer-assisted close reading. And as, I've, as we've seen earlier, this is what happens on Fringepedia, where all these kinds of mysteries are um, illustrated with screen captures from the show and stuff like that. Similar moments of um, operational self-reflexivity are also present in AMC's Homelands. And luckily, uh, yesterday, Greta Olson's excellent keynote already told you all about Homelands, so I don't have to repeat this here. Um, but I want to re return to, uh, to her comments on Homeland yesterday. Um, yesterday, Olson su suggested that Homeland's political agenda as a post-9-11 post text hinges on the show's use of an unreliable narration which repeatedly problematizes the actions and motivations of the show's two main characters. As a result, Homelet asks its viewers to second guess every, no every notion of Nicholas Brody, which we can uh, see here, whose loyalties are constantly shifting between the support of Al-Qaeda and the upholding of traditional American values. Interestingly, it is an immediately self-reflexive -re scene at the end of the first season in which Brody's conflicted char character um, is pointedly thematized, and I have to thank um, Jason Mattel for ex um, this example. And I lifted it from a talk he gave two weeks ago in Göttingen. Um, in Marine One, the first, the se first season finale, oh no, the first season finale, Marine One, opens with, a, with this footage of a self-recorded videotape made by Brody, who will only narrowly avoid killing himself in an act of terrorism later. Spoilers. In the tape, um, Brody claims that, that his reasons to consider an act of terrorism lie not in an allegiance to Al-Qaeda, but instead in his duty as a member of the American military to defend the country against domestic enemies, and so on and so forth. Um, within the, and this is not really what interests me here, but what interests me here is the fact that this video footage is first introduced at the end of the first season and then repeatedly reappears, reappears in several episodes in the second season where different characters watch this footage on diegetic television screens. Um, and this is a, very, a scene that functions very similarly to the scene of Fringe that I showed earlier. These moments casually remind the viewers of the possibility to revisit earlier episodes of the series. Homeland here self-reflexively uh, thematizes its own location within a di di um, digital media environment in which television can be consumed at any time and at almost any place, and in which viewers are invited to binge on a television show by consuming it at their own pace in digital video formats. To wrap up my uh, thoughts on these issues, I would like to suggest um, two conclusions that we could draw from um, these observations. Firstly, I would argue that such moments of operational medial self-reflexivity point us to the changed consumption and reception habits that have resulted from digitalization, or as Jenkins would call it, media conversions. Television series are now no longer necessarily consumed in a linear fashion, but instead ask audiences to engage in a way of watching that repeatedly goes back and forth between different installments of a series. These self-reflexive scenes therefore thematize technical possibilities of digital video formats um, and promote a certain way of employing these technologies, and they th thus might accommodate us to the technological transformations connected to digitalization. Making a similar argument, Frank Kelleter has recently argued that the narrational strategies of complex shows in general call up precisely those cognitive skills, quote, which characterized the neoliberal labor routines in the age of digitalization. That is, network thinking, situational feedback, dispersed processing of information, multitasking, and last but not least, the readiness to no longer differentiate between work and leisure, because similar skills are required both within recreational media consumption and within the workplace. Managing the, managing the attention of audiences, by managing the attention of their audiences and by accommodating their reception practices to the logics of narratively complex television shows, these scenes might therefore be instrumental to train us to productively function within the digital working environments of their 
of our present. And now the time is up. And my second, uh, briefly state my, my second conclusion, which is basically that an attention to these scenes point us to the fact that uh, there's something medially specific about narratively complex television shows that we cannot capture if we consider them only in terms of narrative and not pay attention to their formal features. And with this, I think I should conclude. Thanks. Thank you.